Okay. Uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, developing Newton's method for uh, a 1D scalar equation. And we want to talk uh, today about how to do it for a system of equations. So uh, it's it's a similar approach. Uh, we might have to introduce some concepts that maybe you're not uh, not as familiar with. But what I'm going to do is just remind you sort of what we what we had arrived at for the the single scalar nonlinear function. Okay. So recall. Uh, for a single scalar nonlinear function, uh, we wrote uh, Newton's method as follows. Right? We said it was an iterative scheme, so we had x uh, sub i plus 1, that's the i plus 1th iteration, uh, is equal to x sub i, right, minus uh, f of x sub i over f prime of x sub i, right? And we call it, let's call that equation one. And remember, we're trying to, we've set up the equation such that f of x is supposed to equal zero when our solution uh, is, is valid. Okay? So, uh, remind you, this is, we developed this by uh, projecting the tangent line uh, at uh, x sub i, right, at that solution, um, to the axis and looking for the intersection or at the location of intersection. Okay, so that's how we did it, but we could have we could have taken a, a different approach, right? So let me give you this alternate approach, right? So we could have obtained this result uh, formally by considering a first order Taylor series expansion. Okay, so we could have obtained the same solution by using a first order Taylor expansion. Okay. So if you're like other classes that I've had, every time someone hears the word Taylor series or Taylor expansion, they cringe. There's really no need for that. It's, it's very simple. So what we would say is let's, let's find the Taylor expansion for this quantity f of x i plus 1. What's the value there? Okay. If we do a Taylor expansion and we want to uh, uh, evaluate it about the point x sub i, we would say that this is f of x sub i, right, uh, plus f prime evaluated at x sub i times the quantity x sub i plus 1 minus x sub i, right? And then plus something that's of the order of x sub i squared, right? So we're going to go ahead and ignore this term because it's a first order Taylor expansion. We'll call this equation 2, okay? And we can just solve equation 2 for i by setting, right, the same thing. We want f of x sub i, right, we're trying to find the solution where f of x equals 0. So we're going to try to set that equal to 0 and solve for x of i plus 1, okay? So let's just say solve for x of i plus 1 by setting f of x of i plus 1 equal to 0, okay? And if we do that, you can, you can, this is a very easy algebraic exercise, so I'm not going to go through it all. But hopefully you can see we get at the same solution. x of i plus 1 is equal to x of i minus f of x of i over f prime of x of i. Right? So that's the equation that we get. So this is the same as equation 1. So if you, if you struggle, just go convince yourself of that. It'll take you 30 seconds. Okay? So now let's consider a system, and we're going to solve it the same way, okay? So now, I'll consider a system of equations, okay? And we're going, to, we're going to start with an example of 2 here. We'll use 2 for example, okay? 2, for example, okay? So let's see, what do those equations look like? Well, we, they look very similar to the f of x, but now we'll call it f1, and let's just have it be the... Uh, there would be two variables, f of x and y now, right? So we have multiple functions uh, now in a, in a, a two-dimensional space. So f of f1 of x and y equals 0 is our first nonlinear equation, whatever that happens to be. And f2 of x and y equals 0. That's our second nonlinear equation. We're going to collectively call these equations 3, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to proceed exactly like we did with the Taylor expansion. Let's find the first order Taylor expansion of each function. Okay. So expand each function in a first order Taylor expansion or Taylor series. Okay. 
Okay, so what does that look like in now in a case where we don't have a scalar function? Well, this is where you, you may not be familiar, so I'm just, just going to have to believe me, but I think it's, it's easy enough that it makes sense. We want to look at what is f of uh, x of i plus 1 and y of i plus 1, right? This is an iterative term, just like we had before. It's going to be equal to f, as you might expect now, of x sub i, y sub i, right? But now we have two derivative terms, right? Plus the partial of f1, and this is also f1 here, right? Uh, with respect to x uh, times x of i plus 1 minus x of i. And then another derivative term, uh, partial of f2 with respect to, uh -huh, partial of f1 with respect to y, partial f1 with respect to y, y of i plus 1 minus y of i. And I should also mention that these derivative, partial derivative terms are evaluated at xi, yi. Both of these are, right? xi, yi, right? So that's the first uh, Taylor expansion of that first function. And the second function expansion looks like f2. Now this should be easy. x of i plus 1, y of i plus 1 is equal to f2 of x sub i, y sub i right plus partial of f2 with respect to x evaluated at x sub i y sub i times x i plus 1 minus x sub i and then plus a partial of f2 uh, with respect to y evaluated at x sub i y sub i times times y of i plus 1 minus y of i Right. And let's go ahead and collectively call those equations four. Okay. So now what are we going to do? Well, as before, what is the solution? Well, we know from equation three the solution is when the values of f are equal to zero. Right. So, uh, so as be as with the one d case, we're going to set the um, the f of you know, f1 and 2 of xi plus 1, yi plus 1 uh, equal to 0. So those go to 0. Okay. All right, we're going to do that. Um, and then we're going to rearrange. Okay. So this first equation equals the partial of uh, f1, let's see, with respect to x, evaluated at x sub i, y sub i, times x i plus 1 minus x sub i, right? Uh, and then plus uh, partial of f1 with respect to y, evaluated at x sub i, y sub i, times y of i plus 1 minus y of i. Uh, that's going to be equal to negative uh, uh, f1 evaluated x sub i, y sub i, right? That's the first equation. Second equation looks very similar. So it'll be partial of f2 now with respect to x, evaluated at x sub i, y sub i, uh, times x sub i plus 1 minus x sub i, uh, plus partial of f with respect to y, sorry, f2 with respect to y, evaluated at x sub i, y sub i, now that times y i plus 1 minus y of i, and that's going to be equal to negative f2 of x sub i, y sub i, right? Let's collectively call these equations 5. So we can write 5 actually in matrix form now. So writing equation 5 in matrix form, okay, what does that give us? Well, let me show you. We have this matrix that looks like the partial of f1 with respect to x, partial of f1 with respect to y, and partial of f2 with respect to x, partial of f2 with respect to y. Right, that matrix times the quantity x of i plus 1 minus x of i y of i plus 1 minus y sub i is going to be equal to uh, 
this quantity negative f1 x sub i y sub i and negative f2 x sub i y sub i. Okay, let me make sure that looks okay. I want to say here that we evaluate this at x sub i and y sub i, this whole matrix, right? Okay, so let's let's go ahead and define these as vectors, and then we'll get out of the, the two equations, and it'll let it extend to any number of equations. So let's call this whole vector just the vector f, right? Uh, and we're going to evaluate f um, at, at the quantity xi, however we do that, okay? This vector is actually going to be the vector, we'll call it xi plus 1, right, where I'm, I'm now, I'm switching uh, what I'm defining x. In the first case, x was just a single variable. Now I'm calling x this vector of all of the variables in the equation, all the independent variables, okay? So it's going to be x of i plus 1 minus x of i, right? So let me repeat again, this x of i plus 1 and x is not the same as this. Uh, for example, this x of i plus 1, if I were to give you this exactly, would be x of i plus 1 and y of i plus 1 in this vector. And then this xi vector would be x of i and y of i. Okay, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of sleight of hand there, but hopefully, you know, you're in grad school, so this hopefully is not too confusing. Okay, and how about this term? Well, this term, we're going to call, we're going to call it something you've seen before. It's going to be the Jacobian, the Jacobian matrix of F right where f is this uh, this uh, vector function okay oops I shouldn't write this as a I shouldn't write this as a, a column vector it's a matrix okay so let's call this equation 6 and now all I need to do is I'm trying to solve for x of i plus 1 because that's the solution that I'm that's my new solution I'm going to guess right so let's just say solving 6 uh, for the quantity x of i plus 1 uh, gives the following. Right? We can solve this x of i plus 1. It's going to be equal to x sub i. So it kind of starts out similar to what we had in the 1D case. But now we have this term here that looks like the inverse of the Jacobian matrix that we have there, right, inverse there, times uh, this quantity f, which is a function of x sub i, right? Call this equation 7, okay? Let's box this in. This is Newton's method for a system of equations, okay? So the conceptually, it's pretty straightforward how we operate, and we could code this up very easily. The hard part becomes if you're if you're thinking about like the case of finite elements, you're probably thinking, well, wait a second, how am I gonna how am I gonna get this Jacobian term and get all the right derivatives that I need in there? And the truth is, it's actually somewhat difficult. Okay, I want to make a, a note here about this though, uh, just just as a point of clarity. Okay, note this is something that I don't want you to forget. Okay, the Jacobian of f or the Jacobian matrix, J of F, okay, should not be confused with the Jacobian matrix that we use for mapping integrals, okay? So um, I'm, I'm not going to go into how we're going to calculate all the derivatives yet. I mostly want you to see at, at a high level how Newton's method works for a system of equations. So with that, with, with sort of equation 7 in mind, let's give some remarks about this. Number one, right? As with the 1D case, convergence is not guaranteed. Okay? That's important. If you've ever tried to solve nonlinear problems in finite elements, for example, uh, and you have not come up against problems not converging, then uh, you have been very lucky. Uh, frequently, you'll spend weeks or months trying to get nonlinear problems to converge, which is why in, in industry, a lot of times people don't even mess with nonlinear problems because it's uh, very time consuming and unless it's unless you really uh, feel confident in the results and need them uh, it's oftentimes not worth the effort um, but from a research perspective and in, in and in um, sort of the 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 academic circles it's very important as we're trying to oftentimes understand the sort of fundamental behaviors of materials 
Um, when can we use this? What are the requirements for us to be able to use this method? So here's requirements for use. Okay, number one, all the functions f and their derivatives must be continuous and bounded. Okay, so all functions inside of f and their derivatives, their first derivatives, right? Because if they're not, if their derivatives aren't bounded and continuous, then the Jacobian matrix uh, will be unbounded and, and discontinuous, and you can't invert that. Okay, so so all functions f and their derivatives must be continuous and bounded. Okay, number two, the determinant of j must be non-zero. Why? Because we require it to be invertible, right? Hopefully you remember from linear algebra, you can't invert a matrix if its determinant is equal to zero. And then the third, a little harder to define and harder to enforce, but your initial guess for x sub i should be good, okay? So the other remark I want to make is that this Jacobian uh, inverse, usually it's bigger than something like a three by three. So usually we have to invert the Jacobian numerically. And, and that's something, again, that we're not going to cover extensively in this class, but all your conventional inversion techniques are available to you. And the fourth and final comment that I want to make is that the computing of the derivative terms can be tedious. Maybe tedious is the wrong word. You're thinking, <laughs> I can believe it's tedious. How about it's computationally expensive? Right? As can uh, inverting that matrix if it gets large, right? So if you think of this as a system of um, uh, FEA equations, then the, the Jacobian matrix is going to be uh, the same size as your stiffness matrix, right? So that could be a, a substantial uh, uh, challenge to invert if you have to do it a lot of times, right? So it can be computationally expensive. So uh, we, we oftentimes want to try to use some uh, methods uh, to reduce the computational burden. So there's two that are most commonly used in FEA. So, uh, so I'll just say two methods are commonly used to ease the computational burden. Okay, uh, the first one, let's call it A, is what's called the quasi-Newton approach. And both of these methods are supported in Abacus if you go into um, uh, and look at, at how it's solving it. So the quasi-Newton method. And in the quasi-Newton method, it, it's the same as, as what we have uh, above, right? We still, we still use this iterative approach, but we don't update J every single iteration. We only update it every, you know, you get to specify how often you want to update it, right? So the, the key feature here is you don't update J every iteration. Okay, so that obviously saves you from having to recalculate all the derivatives. It also saves you from having to invert the Jacobian because you've already got it presumably, right? So uh, you can specify how frequently to do it. And there's a balance there too, right? Because you could imagine if I never in, uh, update the Jacobian, I'm, I, can, I may um, think I'm saving time, but I'm not getting closer to my solution. So there's a balance between um, the speed up of the of the solution as a whole versus uh, simply the speed up in let's say uh, a five a five iteration um, uh, amount of time. Okay, and the second that's commonly used, and again, that's also supported by Abacus, is what's called a line search. Okay, and a line search is just finding some optimal value along a chosen search direction. Okay, so you want to find the optimal value. Okay, and I'm not going to I'm not going to dig into how you define optimal. Those of you who've done any optimization knows, knows, know that that's half the challenge in, in optimization is defining uh, how you want to um, quantitatively talk about uh, optimal conditions. So uh, that's, that's the broad strokes of a, of a, Newton's, of a Newton's method for uh, systems of equations. And, and hopefully you can kind of see um, how we're going to have to go about um, solving our finite element equations.